Yo, so we're at 24,809 physical downloads. That's 24,809 downloads. Almost 25,000. Yay. Woohoo. Right on. Righteous. I am Monster Grove. This is C4CW casting 495 celebrities worldwide. If you are true fans of this show, then I, we, 49504 as a whole organization, we most certainly appreciate you. We do. If you are true, true, true fans. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I'm on a roll, man. This is like the fourth podcast episode of the day. I just figured, fuck it, man. I'm getting old. I'm kind of an insomniac a little bit. I can't really fucking sleep a whole lot at times just because how fucking stupid international global affairs are and stupid fucking politicians and bureaucrats from around the world that are irresponsible, not real leaders you know, just fucking hoaxes. They're just fucking not for real. They're just fucking frauds. Lousy, pathetic, low-life, lame o losers Losers! Any fucking way, it's not just that, man. I'm writing a book called Deep in Everett, The Non-Existent City. Yeah, it's, uh, it's official. And that being said, uh, I just, uh, I'm in productivity mode. I know because, uh, you know, having been in media uh, as long as I have been, uh, what, 25 fucking years, the, uh, the, industry shuts, the, the industry shuts down in um, December. <laughs> I had to think about it for a moment. The last month out of the year. So people who are executives like me, I mean, we tend to go on vacation, you know, even sometimes before December. And so the music recording industry is just not operational for the most part during uh, the month of December. And uh, that is a very real thing, traditionally, historically speaking. So uh, I have been working to get this book into stores uh, sooner than later. And uh, I'm at 108 pages currently. And uh, yeah, and that was over a two day, like I did, it was 108 pages in like a two day period of time. So I was like, it was like basically 50 pages a day for two days straight. And now I'm in editing mode because what I'm going to do is I didn't know this. I kind of assumed it to be the case, but I was not a hundred percent certain. And then happened to, you know, search, what is it? Search and ye shall find the truth type ish. I E shit. (laughs) So any freaking who anyway, um, the point is that, uh, I, um, oh yeah. So I'm going to go straight to Kindle as well as paperback And now I have published before. And when I published before, the book was um, the audio. I didn't do it very well. I didn't have the technology that I have now. Now I have 100 percent professional studio recording quality equipment software. Whereas before I was new in the game to audio books and so I did an audio book that didn't turn out so well. And I admit to that it was fucking, it was pretty whack. I mean, it wasn't super whack, but it was pretty fucking super whack. I mean, it, it pretty much was super whack. I should have just recorded it in a better recording environment. And I didn't know how to use that software the way that I know how to use even more advanced software now. So in that regard, I, um, I'm not really so much even focused on the audio book portion of this project for this new project. I have the technology to make it hundred percent professional for this book, this new book. The other book that I wrote was science fiction. This book is uh this is nonfiction. This is a true story. And in that regard, I, uh, I am making this hundred percent professional in all aspects throughout all aspects of the process with my focus currently being on uh, uh, getting the book published to to ebook and uh, paperback, which that's not a problem because my first book that I published the 
uh, book that I told you that the the audio book portion of it was just it wasn't fucking what it was supposed to be. Um, but the paperback version, uh, I've had the capability to make paperback uh, for like 10 years now. So that's not an issue. So this is I just want to get it printed. I want to get it made available so that I can get it into Barnes and Noble and different bookstores around the world and whatnot. What I found out, what my options are, uh, I am able to, I am able to publish it. I don't have to publish the whole book in one sitting. I can create a novella that is a an episode of the book. That's a feature that I do not believe was available ten years ago, at least not with the publishing. Um, program that that I was with back then. Well, this is the same this is the same publisher. It's the same entity. But now I don't have to do a whole book. I can do a half a book at a time. That's not the technical challenge. The technical challenge is that I have to go back and have to edit 108 pages of information. And uh you know, there are some fine points, you know, that I need to that I need to address and cover and make sure that everything is, um, you know, that it sounds right. Words, syntax, sentence structure, because I make it a combination of, um, standard English kind of, uh, some of it is from a scholarly perspective, you know, looking back at the past and dissecting, analyzing, um, presenting information in a certain scholastic, academic, scholarly way. And I mix that with uh, Ebonics, non-standard English slang, and uh, I go back and forth. So it's a lot of uh, of lines of text. I think when I looked, I can't remember, it was like 42,000 words or some shit like that, maybe more. (coughs) Definitely, I do not believe less. I think when I did the word count on Microsoft Word, it said something like 42,000 words, maybe 46,000, maybe 48,000. So it's a lot of words, 108 pages of information. It's not like writing a 25 page, you know, book report for, um, it's not like writing a book report for fucking, um, for school where it's like you're in college and it's like you're pressed to write a 25 page, you know, report on whatever subject. This is like doing four, four of those at the same time. So a lot of lines of text and, uh, it's going to take a couple days. I mean, I'd like to be able to get it done in like one day, but chances are, I hate to say this, man. I mean, ideally it would be done in like one sitting, but you know, I doubt that's going to be the case, uh, but I want to get it out sooner than later so you guys can enjoy it. It's um, it's definitely a roller coaster ride. <laughs> Deep in Everett, the movie in the making. Yes, a non-existent city. So what it's about? What it's what it's what it's about is it's about um, it's about Everett, Washington, in the Puget Sound, Pacific Northwest. Back in uh, the nineteen, the nineteen, uh, so I had to think about it for a moment. Back in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, and um, it uh, it's about how it's it's about the state of Washington, specifically Everett, Snohomish County, and how Snohomish County, the larger county in Everett, Washington including the Puget Sound as a whole, they were beautiful. Green, lush, green, landscape, foliage, beautiful trees, plants, flowers, vegetation. I mean, my grandmother had an awesome garden, sizable, not a small one. She had a big one. We used to plant everything. Um, Peas, corn, celery, cucumbers, um... I mean, it was a well-kept garden as well. I mean, we gave food to people, like neighbors and friends and whatnot, relatives. My grandmother would make these beautiful bouquets. Uh, she had roses. She had a rose bush. Um, 
we had peaches, we had plums, we had, uh, we didn't have cherries. The cherries came from Eastern Washington, but my mother's boyfriend who was from my mother's same military unit, he owns a cherry orchard. They're not together anymore, but he's still friends of our family and, uh, he owns a cherry and apple orchard. My grandmother, however, she did grow, uh, apples. So we had apples, but the cherries would come from him. We had everything that I have already said. We had apricots. We had peas. Uh, what else did we have? Tomatoes. We had uh, um, bu- 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 rhubarb. My grandmother used to make rhubarb pie. Uh, carrots. Carrots, celery. I mean, we grew everything damn near. And uh, onions. And, um, and the list goes on. That's how big her garden was. So we were constantly planning, uh, planting and gardening and cultivating. And I grew up on that property and I left the West coast when I was, uh, in my late twenties, I've been out here for almost 18 years. In fact, I think this is the 18th year. So I've been out here for almost 20 years, uh, almost uh, the same length of time that I spent on the West Coast. So my point is that Washington State, Everett, Washington, the Puget Sound as a whole, it used to be a beautiful place and just a lot of really incredible landscape, um, just amazing scenery, mountains, rivers, lakes, streams, um, parks, just everything conceivable, man. I mean, it was like, these are the days before, like there was opioid addiction as there is now. That is, uh, this is before the, the opioid, you know, crisis throughout America. That's plagued a good part of America. There was no such opioid crisis back then. And, uh, you wouldn't find needles in parks you know, like from people that were, you know, intravenous needle shooters, you know, people shot heroin, of course. Occasionally there would be a needle somewhere outside in society, but it's not like parks now in Everett where they're just like littered with like one needle after another. In the town that I come from, uh, there's always been crime, but I'm talking about the days before there were major crimes like there are now, like one major crime after another. The small town that I'm from, less than 100,000 people. And uh, for the most part, I mean, it was it was very safe growing up in that town. And you wouldn't hear um, a lot of times about major crimes taking place. When there was crime, it was petty, car prowling a burglary here and there. Uh, Somebody like Paul Keller. Paul Keller was an arsonist. Uh, He was burning shit down, and he was a serial arsonist, I should point out. And you would hear about shit like that, but you wouldn't hear about, like, gang crimes, drive-by shootings, major shit that's happening today in this day and age. It was all petty shit back then, aside from, like, Sometimes there would be some major crime. Now, in the town that I'm from, it's major crimes every day of the year. Every day of the year. So that's the fundamental difference. That's the contrast. That's the dichotomy. And so the book is about those days. And then at some point, how some of the youth in the town that I'm from We kind of came up with this concept before people started to hear about the multiverse like we do in popular uh, lore, L-O-R-E, pop, Euler lore. Before we started to hear about the multiverse and all these different movies, comic books, anime, video games, pop culture, popular culture, before the concept of the multiverse was popularized, There was almost no such thing. I mean, yeah, in some comic book somewhere, in some book somewhere, the ancients talked about gateways, the other universes and shit. 
but you would never hear about anything called the fucking multiverse back in the 1970s. I know there are some hippie gurus, again, some people who were hip and they, they communicated about, you know, the many worlds interpretation of what is our known and also unknown universe. But for the most part, there was no mention ever of a multiverse. So the point is that back in those days, uh, life was very simple. There was no internet, just didn't exist, wasn't created yet. There were no smartphones. So no smartphones, no internet uh, for the public. The military had the internet uh, 1969 and uh, probably even before that. I'm just saying that, you know, it's rumored that there are two different governments that govern this planet. There's the U.S. government and then there's the which is the terrestrial government. And then there's the non-terrestrial alien government that the United States works with our terrestrial government. It's said that the Internet has existed since 1969. Is that the actual number? I don't fucking know if that's the real year. That's when we are told that the Internet came uh, into existence by way of our U S military. Uh, so yeah, but, and, and, but moving forward in that same information, uh, it talks about how in the book, my book, deep in Everett, a non-existent city, how a group of youth became a musical group i.e. rap group, and then came up with this concept that basically where the members talked about growing up in a city that didn't really exist. And what we meant by that back then was that all these things were going on in the United States, like L.A. fucking gang crime drive-bys and everything that gangs do, and then New York and major places like Chicago, and then Texas, Houston, and Dallas, and wherever, Fort Worth. Name a major city in the United States. Well, our city wasn't a major city. In fact, it was a city that most people didn't even fucking know existed. And uh, major shit was beginning to happen in our town. Gangs were migrating from LA, Los Angeles, and other parts of California. Wasn't just LA, but a lot of L.A. based gangs started to make their way to our town and not just Los Angeles, but from New York and Texas and Chicago, the Midwest. I mean, you name it. It was any major city and not so major city at some point kind of living in what, you know, can be thought of as a vacuum on the West Coast where Our city wasn't really known to most of the United States. All of a sudden, gangs from all around the United States wanted to come to our town and other types of organized crime groups, not just gangs from California and Chicago, organized crime networks. They wanted to come to our town specifically and particularly because they found out that uh, crack cocaine sold for more, a higher profit in the city of Everett, Washington, than anywhere else in the nation. It was in the news, headline news. So we're talking about headline news. At some point says, Everett, Washington is a town in the Pacific Northwest, Puget Sound, north of Seattle by just maybe 30 miles-ish. And crack cocaine, a person can make more money there selling it than in any other town city in America. Boom. Boom. Our, our, our town was flooded overnight and not just our town, not just Everett, but the surrounding towns, the surrounding cities, the entire county. And then, of course, other uh, counties in our state. And uh, there is a town east of the mountains on the other side of uh, Washington state because Everett is on the coast uh, on the west uh, side of the state on the east on the eastern side of, of the state. There is actually a desert. And a lot of people are not knowing that there's a desert. They're unfamiliar with the fact that Washington State, the eastern part of the state, is uh, largely desert. 
they hear about Seattle over on the coast and they think Seattle, the Space Needle, the big structure in the city, you know, the big tower, Seattle Space Needle, the big, uh, you know, um, it's the Space Needles. I guess it's a monument. Um, you know, people can go inside it and they used to be able to go to the top of it. I don't know what the, you know, rules are now since we've had COVID and apparently COVID's here to stay. Uh, I've been here for, like I said, almost 18 years, if not 18 years. So I don't know if the Space Needle is shut down to the public, if it's open. I have no fucking clue. I guess I could just Google it right now and look to see if it's open or closed. But the point is, is that a lot of people, when they think of Seattle, they think of the Space Needle. They think of Western Washington. They think of seeing those mountains in the background. They think of seeing that West Coast line, you know, the Pacific Ocean and whatnot. They don't know that the eastern part of Washington State is a desert. They don't know. So over in eastern Washington, there's a town called Yakima. And if you Google it, I don't know if this is still the case, but Yakima had at some point been the number one town. In other words, it was the town in in the United States, in America, in the Western Hemisphere that had the most cocaine distribution than in any other town. Volume of distribution. So on the Western side of the state, Everett, Washington, the town that I'm from, cocaine sold for more than anywhere else in America. Yes, out of all of the fucking thousands of cities and towns in America, it happened to be the town that, I, that I'm that i from, that I grew up in. What a coincidence. Across the state by several hours distance-wise, on the side of the state where there is largely a desert, there is a small town called Yakima. Y-A-K-I-M-A. Yakima. Some people just say Yakima. The point is, that's where the most cocaine was sold in the United States of America. It was like shipped and distributed, trans-shipped. That was the trans-shipment zone of unprecedented proportion. So Washington State was basically the capital of cocaine for the whole United States of America. It wasn't California, and California has 40 million people in it. You would think that it was California. It wasn't California. To the north of California, a lot of cartels and organized crime networks, they migrated to the state of Washington, and they set up shop because it got too hot on the streets in California, so they made Washington State the number one dope spot. There's never been a movie about it. Not a blockbuster movie. I know people who have made... I heard that there was a movie that was made about uh, Everett and different parts of um, Seattle, Everett, Tacoma. Uh, I heard some rumors about it. I haven't seen it, but I know that it wasn't, at least as far as I know, there is no blockbuster movie that's ever been made with a mega budget. And this is not to discredit the people who made the uh, independent film that they made. I even heard at some point that it was on Netflix or something to that extent, which is awesome. I'm glad that they were able to get some of the message and some of the information out. I don't know how well it's produced. I don't know. So, but what I do know is that there's never been a major blockbuster movie uh, on the subject because if there had been a major blockbuster movie on the subject then, yeah, I would know about it and the people from my town would be talking about it so it's never happened. (laughs) Never, ever happened. So I wrote the book myself. It's called Deep in Everett, A Non-Existent City. And in the book, there there, what I talk about is how when we were kids growing up, before... The migration of the organized crime, gangs, cartels, and so forth. The major migration. We lived in a really nice town, and it was really beautiful, and it was 
pretty safe. I mean, boys fought each other in neighborhoods and whatnot, but it was innocent shit that boys do throughout America. It's just what kids do. They fucking fight each other and shit growing up. It wasn't anything insane. There were no stabbings. Um, for the most part, no one shot up a school. There were no fucking major school shootings. In fact, there were zero school shootings. Zero. Keep in mind, like I said, L.A. gangs had not migrated to, to our town yet. No L.A. style drive-bys. No crazy fucking homicides of a gang nature. They were not happening yet. We grew up playing sports, bikes, scooters, skateboards, just normal, innocent shit that kids, boys and girls do. And then the gangs and the, the organized crime networks and the cartels, they showed up and it fucking turned our city into some other shit where it became a parallel universe of what it used to be. And again, at some point, there had been a time when before that, nobody fucking really knew about our town. Nobody knew about Everett, Washington for the most part. I mean, when I say no one, I mean, obviously people did it was in tourist books and it was on the map, but most of the world didn't fucking know jack shit about Everett, Washington. Most of the world didn't fucking have a clue that the town existed. And that's why the book is titled Deep in Everett a non-existent city.